This is Risky Women Radio, a show that connects, celebrates and champions women in risk, regulation and compliance. We're here to share the insights on the biggest issues in our industry and hear inspiring journeys from our global members. Sign up to our newsletter at riskywomen.org. I'm Kimberly Cole, your Chief Risky Woman. Welcome to Risky Women Radio. Today's Risky Woman is Rupal Patel. She made the Women in Fintech Power List 2021 in the Senior Leaders category. She was also a Women of Fintech Shining Star. And along with that, she is the founder of Women in Risk and Control. So Rupal can be described as a senior risk and control and governance leader, an advisor, an adversity and inclusion champion. She's influencing the development and implementation of compliant regulatory change strategies from a risk perspective in financial services. She has over 20 years experience with tier one global investment banks in operational risk, compliance and front office controls. And in December 2019, she moved to a pre-seed fintech startup called ASIN, which we'll hear a little more about during our chat. In 2020, she founded Women in Risk and Control, which is a collaborative industry initiative to positively impact gender diversity in non-financial risk management at senior leadership levels. And I'm super excited to hear more about that because obviously with Risky Women, we love the ecosystem of networks that are being created. So welcome, Rupal. Thank you, Kimberly, for having me on your show. So let's start by taking us on your sort of career journey. And while you're doing that, maybe tell us a little about where you've ended up at ASIN as well. Sure. You know, career journeys are so interesting to hear. I love hearing about other people's career journeys. So I hope that mine is somewhat inspiring to the listeners as well. But it always makes me think of where do I start on this? And I thought in this session, I'd probably talk a little bit about that organic movement of moving from one company and one job to another and how that's come about through What I've thought about more recently is push and pull factors. And I'll tell you a bit about those pull factors that have pulled me into new career paths and push factors that have kind of pushed me out of old ones, I guess. And I think for me, when I was thinking about my career journey, I've had this question a lot. Normally it's ranting off, you know, the journey that you've been through and the firms you've worked at. But as I was thinking about it, I fell in love with this push and pull factor idea. And I thought it might be a better way to get individuals to think about their career journeys as they develop as well. I love that. Yeah, that's a great way of sort of positioning how you've moved. So that's really interesting. Yeah, like I started off, you know, like many people do going into university and my parents came from Africa. So they built their own business here. They were pushed out of Uganda in the 70s, came over, were not hugely educated individuals. And so they always wanted me to study and study hard. And that's a very Indian thing as well. You know, a lot of Indian families studying is very important to them. So of course I did the traditional, went to university, but I had very little guidance on what to do after that phase because my parents had set up their own shop and they did fantastically well owning a car parts business and really growing that and developing that. But that wasn't for me. And so I went to university and I I really liked the idea of investment banking. It sounded great. I must say the law of the money and the fact that, you know, you can build a good career and a good life out of it was part of that decision as well. And I'd seen people who'd done well in it, but I didn't know anyone in that space. So I fell out of university thinking, where do I go? I tried coding, but I wasn't very good at that. So I decided not to really pursue that as a career, even though I knew tech was so important and was growing in importance even back then. And I went and did a master's in investment banking to understand the lay of the land, to understand a little bit more about what is this whole financial institution business? What is it all about? And I fell out of university and I would say I was pulled into my first role. So a headhunter called me after doing my master's degree and said, hey, we've got this role at Goldman Sachs. It's in operations. I'll be honest, I didn't really know what the operations part of an organization of the likes of Goldman's did at the time, really. Obviously, I knew about m and I knew about sales, I knew about trading, but no one really talks about the support functions that support all of those activities. And so I was pulled into that role. And it was my first stint. And of course, who's going to say no to Goldman Sachs? And you know, I loved my time there. 
And everything that I did there taught me about the backbones of an organization, how it works and how it develops. And from there on in, my boss said, please join the graduate program, apply for it, I'll help you. And I said, you know what, I've kind of made enough money in my first year, I want to go traveling. Whether that was a good choice or not, I don't know, I gave up a graduate program to go traveling, but it was something that I needed to do for myself and something that I'd never do if I didn't do it at that point in time. So I went traveling, I was fortunate enough to do that and I came back and I thought, what do I do now? You know, operations was fun, it was good, but it wasn't where my heart was. So I asked a few friends what they were doing and these new terms of flying around, CDSs, credit default swaps, synthetic CDOs, I had no idea what these were. And I asked a few friends what they were doing. They talked to me about pricing these securities. They talked to me about doing the P&L on these securities and getting my foot in the door to understand what these were. And that enticed me. That was interesting. I thought I could learn. And that's where I started to fall in love with the credit products within financial institutions. And I went into a finance role looking at the P&L. I then was pushed out of that role and pulled into another organization, started to look at valuing these securities because I really liked them. So I looked at valuing synthetic structured credit securities. I'm not a modeler, I'm not a quant, but I could talk to the quants about it because I was interested in it, because I could explain what I wanted the model to do, but couldn't build the models myself. And so that was really important. And I got to learn a lot from that part of it. I was then pulled from another headhunter into a very different path. So looking at credit rating agencies, and I moved to a company called DBRS, Dominion Bond Rating Services, and they had just set up shop in England at the time. Unfortunate for me, it was a very short stint. It was only four months because they closed their shops within four months because of the credit crisis. So I was pushed out that role quite quickly and I had to find something else. So, you know, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. I moved into finance, doing valuation roles, looking at structured product, and then really came the credit crisis. And structured products stopped being structured products, and we had to go back to the vanilla products. So valuing vanilla products was not so exciting for me anymore, and I wanted to do something different. And that really led me to looking at projects in the space that I was, and looking at the SOX program that we had in place at the time. And I started to revamp the whole SOX program, taking it from something that really frustrated me, which was like, let's just tick a box and get this done, to something that was actually useful. And I think I was able to do that because of all of the other roles I had before, because I really understood the processes and how to build a program that could evidence We've got the right controls in place, but we're managing risk effectively and still allowing the business to grow. And so that's where I fell in love with, I guess, and organically moved to OpRisk. And then I moved from there into a frontline role in rates trading. And within the front office business, of course, you get to talk a lot more to the traders and you get to work on conduct and culture and all sorts of interesting ideas and improvements. I then moved over and was pulled out of that organization through another headhunter into an op-risk role and fell in love with that op-risk role, looking at MIFID 2, rolling out regulatory change, and then into e-trading. And then, of course, from there, I got pulled into fintech. And fintech is super exciting. So I can talk to you a little bit about fintech and my move over from banking, which is for 20 years, into fintech. Sure. And I mean, I love the push and pull concept. That's very interesting. But also that sort of zigzag and looking at that whole breadth of areas that you can get into and how you can explore those different areas, use the skills that you've gained in one and build on them in another. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think it actually helps you to do a good job at where you next land. If you can take the experience and the learning from a prior role, and use that going forward, I think that really helps and elevates your career and sets you apart from just the person who's theoretically following a manual, as it were. Yeah. And what have been some of those lessons that you feel that you've learned along the way? You know, I think there's some really important lessons that I wish I had been talked through. And I wish these podcasts existed at the time. So I think these are amazing, by the way. And I think it's really going to help to shape the next generation of leaders in risk and control. I think most importantly is, um, I never really understood the value of a good network. 
I understood what people meant by, yeah, go out and network, make sure you've built your group of individuals that you can talk to. But there's very little guidance around how do you build that network? Like, what is a network really? What is a mentor? How do you get a mentor? And I think the most important advice I would give is build those networks in all different shapes and forms. So not just within your own team and your own organization, but outside the organization. So we are so fortunate now that we have LinkedIn, we have these podcasts, we have a lot of webinars that we are exposed to. All of these individuals on these webinars, podcasts, etc., are contacts that you can reach out to. And I would really advise people to start to build their networks from people they've heard that have influenced them or that they look up to or that they want to learn from. And I think, you know, always think the doors open because if you think the doors shut, you've already stopped yourself from asking the question of can you help me or what do you advise? So go out there and be bold and brave and ask those questions because, you know, you can build great contacts from going to a conference, going to a webinar, and just listening to people. I'll give you a real life example. Just the other day, I listened to a webinar from the University of Columbia, and the lecturer there was talking about risk and control, of course. But I am going to go and reach out to them as a result of listening to that webinar, because I think what they said was just so interesting, and I want to see how we might be able to work together. So that is just a real example of see something, hear it, do something about it. Don't just sit and wait for things to come on your way. I agree. And I also think people are more than ready to help generally, if you ask. And I also think you've always got something to give back. So, you know, making sure there's that two-way street. But I I think always ask because they can only say no. So everyone's got to just get out there. And I think just on that point is um, give yourself some time. They might not be available for you today. But in a year's time, they might just reach out to you again. So don't be disheartened. I mean, I think the first time I spoke to you, Kimberly, was probably over a year ago. And then we spoke again very recently. But we were always liking and sharing each other's posts and everything. But it didn't mean that nothing comes out of it. You know, it's a conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Timing is everything. I always say. (laughs) You mentioned a couple of risks there like you know going off and traveling for a year which I also agree like there's sort of key times when you can do that and it was best to do that and really open your mind to so many things what other risks do you think you've sort of taken in your career I think probably two that I think is worthwhile sharing actually one is really being able to be confident in who you are and believe in yourself so let me back this up with a little bit of a story or a journey that I went through to give you some context around that. So when you see things within your job, within your sphere of control that you think are not working the way they should be working, or you think that there's a better way of doing them, I think you have to be bold enough to call it out and say it how it is, even if you're talking to people who are more senior than yourself. So go with the facts, be prepared. But believe in yourself and take it to the end of that conversation. Don't just raise a point and then say, oh, I've raised it, I'm done, and hope that someone's going to take that on board. Really take that point to the end. So I'll give you an example. When I was working in one of these large organizations, I was asked to value certain securities and a huge portfolio of securities. And I was very uncomfortable with valuing them because A, we didn't have the resources, B, we didn't have the information we needed to value them, and C, the method chosen to value them just didn't sit right with me. It was far too proxy originated, and my thoughts were that you really had to understand the underlying portfolio in depth to give a true reflection of the value of this product. And my superiors really didn't like that answer. The answer was that it's going to take a long time, basically, and they wanted it done in a month. And it was just impossible for me to do that and justify that value. And so I said to them, you know, this isn't the way that we should be doing it. And these are the risks of doing it in this way. Obviously, they gave it to somebody else and somebody else picked it up. But what I was frustrated with is not believing in myself and not being confident enough to really push that and to get them to see where I was coming from and what the problems were. 
I really wish I had because if I had, we'd have saved millions and millions, if not billions. So look, believe in yourself, build that network of trusted colleagues that you can go and talk to about these things. I didn't have that at that point, so I wish I had. So that goes back to that network point we talked about. If you have those trusted colleagues, you can have conversations with, pull them in to help you to pitch what you're trying to say. So that's one of the big lessons and the big risks, I guess, that I've gone through. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think that ability of having, being able to back things up, but that speaking truth to power is a really important skill to learn. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's difficult, right? I think, you know, confidence grows with experience as well. So learn from those mistakes. You might have ups and downs. I certainly did have my share of downs, I would say, but you've got to pick yourself up and learn from them and use that information in the next role. The other area of risk, I think, that I have taken personally in my career is, of course, moving out of these giant organizations with huge financial backing, with a huge presence in the market, and going to a pre-seed company like ASIN, which at the time had 20 people. You know, no one knows who they are. They practically don't exist because if you say I work for Ace and everyone's like, yeah, okay, what? Well, like, if you say you work for Morgan Stanley, Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, everybody knows, okay, great. There's a level of status, I guess, associated with working with a big bank that you may like to be accustomed with. Letting go of that and going into this space where no one knows what this is, no one knows really what you're trying to build and neither do you, but you're working on a vision and you're trying to build that vision. That is hugely empowering. I mean, I absolutely love the fact that I took that leap of faith and really grateful to the headhunter who found me to do that. But I think, you know, look, take that risk and move to a company that you can see yourself in and that you can align yourself with that vision on. So it's a hugely risky move. So if you don't like what that fintech or that new company is doing, you're not going to be working to your 100%. But for me, I've been able to wear three different hats in the three years that I've been there. And even within wearing those specific hats, I've always had a varied role. So I've never really been in sales, but I've been pulled into sales meetings. I'm not a marketer by trade, but I was pulled into the marketing department to rebrand the company, to build their actual marketing pitch books to talk about the lines that they were going to use with customers, with prospects, to look at product marketing. And those are all things that I never thought that I would do. You know, marketing was a whole different ball game. But actually, it's taught me so much. It's taught me so much that I have taken on to my next role within that group, which is around leading risk intelligence and using data. And, you know, how do we talk to customers about this? How do we market this? What are the lines that we're going to use to talk about it? So. Look, moving to fintech is risky for sure, but for me, it's hugely paid off. And I would say if you are the kind of character who likes agility, who's happy to really put in hard work, to work like that 110%, to not have a script and be okay with that, to not be defined by a job description, because that job description is probably accurate for 5% of your time. And then you have to be very flexible around it because you're you're building a business. You're not just working in a siloed function. So those are the things to kind of bear in mind if you're going to take those risks. I think that's great advice for our audience. So can you give us sort of a quick view of what ASIN actually does? Because it sounds fascinating and I get that you've got this sort of flexibility, but obviously there's a vision that you're aiming for. So tell us about that. Absolutely. So ASIN is really pioneering where operational risk should be. And we're doing that to build a safer financial services industry as a whole. And so what do we actually do? What we actually do is take risk and control data from organizations, from top tier investment banks, asset managers, moving into retail, et cetera. We take this information we use AI and we train our AI, but we also use specialists who've worked in investment banking to connect data sets together. And we anonymize that and send that back out to our clients. So this really allows our customers to understand what are the risks and controls that they need to operate a specific business. For example, to trade credit, to trade equities, to trade FX. What are the risks and controls that you need front to back throughout the organization so that you can manage this business and have a good framework in place 
for managing that business. And by allowing customers to see what this benchmark is, they're able to compare themselves to their peers. So they've never been able to do that before. The regulator normally comes in knocking on the door and says, by the way, you know, I've seen X, Y, Z, other banks have this, where is yours? They get their information from seeing other people's data sets, let's say. Being in a bank as yourself, you're blind to that information. So what ASIN allows is an anonymized view of where you are compared to your peers, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, but also more importantly, how you can elevate yourself to manage your risk most effectively. And we do that through data. So yeah, that's one part of it. And then I'll talk to you more later about some of the risk intelligence pieces that we're building on as well. Yep, love to hear about that. And just on this sort of additional elements of your career, you built or you founded the network Women in Risk and Control. So tell us a bit about that as well. Absolutely. Women in Risk and Control was founded in 2020. We started having the conversations just before COVID around how do we see a better representation of senior women in panels talking about risk and control? I had had a career in investment banking where I had seen some extremely great females. And when I moved across to ASIN, we looked at doing panels and we looked at building a community. But what we found was that there wasn't the right representation of senior female leaders being represented. And we started to discuss the idea of a network that could really elevate individuals to get to their career successes so that they could reach the pinnacle of their careers based on and empowered by a community that would really support them. And I think this came from two things. One, it came from our CMO at the time, Ian Ewart, who's absolutely fantastic, who really said to me, you should think about setting up a network and building a community, to which I said, there's so many women's communities. What am I going to do? You know, I don't want to just do another one. And when he started looking at it, we thought my career experience had not always been so great with many women helping me along my career. So I must say, you know, you will come across people who help you and you may also come across people who don't help you. That's just the way it is, but that's not the way that it has to be. And so that's what I really thought about when I started to set this up. And I played the idea back with a lady called Sally Clark, who really knows the risk and control space extremely well, but is hugely talented as well. And she's on boards, she's a non-executive director, she's been a managing director at some of these large organizations. So she really knows the importance of building that community as well. And really, Women in Risk and Control grew from that conversation of, is there enough interest that we think we're going to be able to gather? And is there a niche? And we thought, yes, there is. I love risk and control. I could talk about it forever. I think people need to have that community. And I'd love to be part of helping to build that collaborative industry initiative that can help with gender diversity and get people to those senior leadership levels if that's what they choose to do. So we started Women in Risk and Control organically, but what we did is we built a leadership team. So I now have a leadership team of about 15 individuals. These individuals work at the likes of the London Stock Exchange, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank. And the idea of building that leadership team was around who else cares about this topic and wants to help other people to grow. And who can help me to develop this as well? So these are individuals who help to lead the initiative and to grow the initiative. And what we have done is we've come up with three key objectives that we wanted to achieve. And that is to nurture that cross-firm network of individuals and talent. It is to build that community to enable career progression and to empower. And thirdly, it was around providing and facilitating meaningful mentoring opportunities. So I'll go into that a little bit. But what we've built so far is a number of webinars where individuals can go and learn about the topics around risk and control, but also wider aspects of growing your career, managing difficult teams, for example, to group mentoring. And we talked a lot about mentoring. And mentoring is very difficult because it's a very personal relationship that needs to be built for it to be successful. So we came up with the idea of group mentoring, which is really where an expert talks about a specific 
area or sector of risk and control that they are very good at and that they want to share their knowledge and experience with. And they do so in a semi-closed group of individuals who want to know more about that. And from there, if that relationship sparks and people want to take that relationship further and go on to individual mentoring, they can do so. But we offer that group mentoring and bring that together. That's great. That's a really good idea, group mentoring. I think it also sort of takes the pressure off the mentees that there's a whole group of them who can all ask questions and they can all learn. Yeah, I think, you know, often, like, especially when you start your career, you want to ask certain questions, but you're afraid to, or you don't know how to put it out there. And I think, you know, the more people that you see who have the desire to learn something about a topic, the easier it is for you to start asking questions. And we try and do it with faces on, cameras on, so that we could see each other and build that relationship. So I think that will really help individuals as well. And we've done about 10 of them so far, and I'm hoping we can do at least one a month. Excellent. So you've done a lot of very interesting things. And if you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would be your dream career? I've always thought about this, you know, I think let's go back to when I was 17, very young. I always loved the idea of hospitality and hotels and restaurants. And I think that came from, and this will give away some of my age, the media around Paris Hilton at the time. So I really started looking at the Hilton Group and got fascinated with it. Oh, my gosh, how did they build this chain of hotels around the world that are amazing hotels? You know, everyone goes to them. And I fell in love with the idea of hospitality, actually. And before I went to university, whilst I was picking my courses, obviously business, finance, et cetera, were on the list. But a left field idea was going on a course around hospitality. And so I went to see a university that specialized in this. It was in Wales, actually. I ended up in Cardiff University doing accounting and management, far, far less glamorous than I think hospitality. But I went to see this university which um, talked about hospitality. And one of the things they said you had to do was a course on cooking. And cooking isn't my skill set. And I don't really enjoy it. I love eating, but cooking, I just kind of bores me. So I think, unfortunately for me, that was the death of hospitality and hotels. Although I will say, look, I'm still hugely fascinated with that world. And, you know, risk and control exists everywhere. And I do see that maybe at some point in my career, I could move across into risk and control and hospitality. Excellent. Combine both passions. Let's move on to sort of your area of expertise around operational risk. So I guess lay the sort of lie of the land for us give us the overview of operational risk for sure so operational risk look i fell in love with it when i started to look at SOX programs within finance operational risk just to lay it down is really the risk of loss from flawed or failed people processes systems or external events it's the classic description really what does that mean um think about it people processes systems external events basically covers everything Something can go wrong in any part of your business that will involve those four elements. And operational risk is trying to manage the risk that these areas are managed effectively so that you can still generate revenue, but so that your risk is controlled. So the areas of expertise within this space are very broad that I have been through. And I think this will give you an idea of just the breadth of how big operational risk really is. And I'll take it in the sense of the people, processes, systems and external events. So from a people perspective, operational risk really talks to the human risk, behavioral risk, talent, culture, conduct. Those are elements that some people see that fit in the non-financial risk management space, which is slightly like an all encompassing, including op risk. But for me, when I look at an operational risk incident, let me give you a specific example. I was working in the rates trading business within a large investment bank. And my role there was to build the right first line framework for risk management. One of the things that was so key at the time that I was working there was around conduct and conflicts of interest. And this was obviously after the financial crisis when the FCA came out with their five conduct rules for senior managers and for the rest of the organization and global regulations, you know, followed around that space. Identifying a conflicts of interest log is it's a really challenging space because you start thinking about 
Okay, so what is a conflict of interest? How are people involved in a conflict of interest? And what do they need to be able to know? How do they need to be able to conduct themselves? So we worked on a conflicts of interest log that we developed. We listed out those conflicts of interest with the top traders in that business at the time. And we looked at what are the controls that we can set up around managing these conflicts of interest, but still allowing the business to generate revenue in a controlled manner. That's the conduct side, conflict side, the people side. Processes, if I move to processes, I talked about SOX, I talked about finance. So what got me into operational risk and got me loving operational risk was a organic movement of roles, which I talked about a little bit in the beginning. But what I was asked to do was to take a program, which was the SOX program, and just to run it. And that SOX program let me tell you, it was a series of questions that were asked to senior individuals within the global valuations group. And each individual would answer around 20 to 50 questions on a scale of one to five. Now, think about the subjectivity of a scale of one to five, first of all, think about the different individuals, and then think about their understanding of each of those 50 questions and whether that's the same or not. So we did this assessment, and this was meant to be the SOC certification that everyone within finance, within that specific group, knew what they were doing, were abiding by the rules and regulations. It really bothered me that this was just an amalgamation of one to five cobbled together really at the end of the day and averaged as a score. It didn't really mean anything. It didn't help the business really, but it allowed the business to tick a box. That I needed to change. So I built a whole new SOC program which really focused on how do firms value securities? And I was able to do that because I'd worked in valuing securities. And so we came up with the steps to value securities and what are the controls around those steps? For example, you need the right population, first of all, to feed into your systems. You can't miss trades out. Every single trade needs to have a valuation or needs to have a reserve. Then how are you going to value it? What are the models that you're using to value it? What are the assumptions that you're making? What are the reserves that you're going to take? What's the methodology? And so forth. So that's a kind of overview of transformation and process that I've been involved with. Reg change is another one, MIFID 2. I built a nine-step process for translating regulatory change, for understanding risk, documenting it through controls, tying it into assurance activity from a first line and second line. And then there's systems, of course, and that comes to what are the systems that we're going to put in place to manage risk effectively? And of course, ASIM plays a part in that. And then there's the external environment. And this is the really interesting bit that more so as I've grown in my career has kept me interested in operational risk, I think. Operational risk is impacted by external influences. So the biggest ones, of course, that all of us will know about is Brexit, the 2008 financial crisis, COVID, the supply chain impacts of COVID, everything happening now with the geopolitical arena that we all live in. Those are all impacting the operational risk environment of every single organization in the world right now. And the fact that operational risk changes so quickly, but also is so matrixed, is just so interesting. And that has really allowed me to build my career. So those are some of the areas that I've been involved with and had expertise in. That's really interesting. And I do think the other thing that's quite interesting is obviously you're trying to anticipate a whole lot of different factors that could come into play. So potentially when you're doing risk well, and certainly operational risk well, you're mitigating a lot of the things going wrong. So it's kind of a interesting thing, like how do you know that you were successful while nothing went wrong? You've given some good examples there of when you're really trying to anticipate what's happening. But I do think it's kind of often challenging to identify when you have done things well in that space. Yeah, I think you're 100% correct there. Operational risk doesn't get kudos for getting things right because it's not visible. We are not a revenue generating part of an organization. So you can't just say I've made 100 million, here you go. What you can say is I tried to prevent a loss or I tried to prevent things from going wrong. They are all qualitative, subjective forms of justifying operational risks 
existence. And so it is difficult because it's not a quantitative discipline and it's hard to identify exactly what you said when you've done it well. But if we think about what happens when you don't do it well, I think trying to explain to organizations in the right context. So let's just take something that I've been working on a lot recently is obviously everyone's heard about all the fines to do with unauthorized communication. Okay, let's take like 10 steps back before this really came out into the market. Everyone was involved with a clean desk policy. You often saw when you walked around a trading floor, no mobile phones on the trading floor. Everyone thought these were tiny little pieces of up risk, trying to exert their influence on the organization, trying to do the right thing, but really didn't associate much value to those. If we take that whole point of having a clean desk, i.e. making sure important information is kept hidden, is kept in authorized ways, you take the idea of no mobile phones on the trading floor, that means you can't send information to people who shouldn't have it. And then you think about what's happened in the past year with the fines on unauthorized communication. You can quickly see why up risk is so important, but you've got to be able to relay that story, culture, conduct being built in for people to understand why that control is there. What's the point of having that no mobile phones on the trading floor? Seeing that there alone is not enough to explain to non-risk professionals and to the rest of the organization why it's important. So for me, I think risk is like the heartbeat of an organization and it really is that lifeblood, but it goes across many stripes of risk, especially in today's environment where risk is just so commingled. And all of this, an organization works with people. So conduct, culture, behavior is just so important without getting people to understand why you're doing things. It's you're on a losing path. Yeah. So tell us then, what's ASIN doing to really tackle operational risk differently? Tell us what's going on there, because I think that's very interesting. ASIN is a hugely interesting organization. We are pioneering a data-led approach, firstly. So talking about moving it from that qualitative discipline that we said to something that can be data-led, be more quantitative, that can really be used so that people can analyze data and use that analytics to then form opinion on. So I'm not saying, you know, we're going to take away the qualitative side of our risk. That's not going to happen. But what we can do is do a much better job of taking all of the data, structuring that data and allowing organizations to have a data-led approach to managing operational risk. So ASIN's ability to take other people's data sets together to anonymize that data and provide institutions with that overview of how are they operating compared to their peers gives them a competitive advantage because it allows them to then see what do I need to change? What are my peers doing? They are not giving us information that no one else knows about. Everyone knows risks and controls that operate. How you then implement those risks and controls and how you form your organization around it is going to be the competitive advantage. But we are giving organizations that data to allow them to retain their own competitive advantage and to also to learn from each other. So by continuously sharing that data set, we see new controls coming on. We see new risks arising. Our tool allows organizations to dynamically manage risk through horizon scanning. We can talk about that more later if you wish to also. But horizon scanning and dynamic risk management is a huge part of our offering as well. So, you know, just getting the benchmark is a first step. Yeah, I was going to say, what are those kind of key areas of focus that should be on the agenda? And especially now you've got this sort of data landscape that you can use to inform that. What are those areas? I think, look, Oprisk has grown and matured over like I don't know, since the financial crisis, it's really developed and it's developed organically because of how organizations have approached it, but also how they've been pushed into doing things from the regulatory perspective. And often what's happened is it's been an amalgamation of data and knowledge, but it's been built up over time and not necessarily in a structured manner. Now the industry is a little bit more mature. We have a lot of knowledge experience. We have a massive data behind it. Now is the time that I think people need to look at standards. 
So I'm not saying they never looked at standards before. All organizations will have their standards around how they write a control, how they put in place a risk framework. But from my experience, what I saw is that these standards were often different in different parts of an organization in different functions. So to give you an idea, you know, front office might write their controls in a very detailed manner. Operations might write their controls at a very high level. So they're still following the standard of documenting it in a specific way, but they're just writing it very differently. So now I think is the time of really using standards and ASIN helps to build those standards as well to give you a framework for building those standards. So I think with that, you can start to build data analytics. Without that, everyone's starting on a different footing and you can't compare. Within large organizations, you've got to be able to have different views. You've got to have your business view, your regional view, your legal entity view, your global view, your cross business view. All of those pieces of data need to be able to be combined. So you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to pears so that you've got that aggregate risk. So that's the structure and the standards. And you mentioned horizon scanning as well. So tell us more about that. So horizon scanning, that's super key. So I think, you know, we talked a little bit about what's happening in the geopolitical arena, what's happening around external events, and just knowing from the past two years just how commingled everything is. Horizon scanning is all of that. It's looking at what is happening in my world around me. What are news feeds saying? What are the regulators doing? What regulatory change is upcoming? What are the consultations out there? How am I going to get these news feeds in place? And what am I going to do with them? So horizon scanning is looking at the environment around you to find out what are the alerts that will trigger you to conduct some kind of analysis of your environment to see whether or not you're able to cope with that risk or that threat. And from there, what you can build is risk scenarios. And risk scenarios are plausible events that you think can happen in the near future or in a longer period of time if that's your horizon that you're looking at and trying to really see what are the risks and controls associated with that and what are the threats that can cause that scenario to happen. So that's a very quick and broad overview of horizon scanning and a little bit about risk scenarios as well. Very, very interesting. So when you're thinking about sort of who's doing it well or who's kind of leading the way and what the impact's been. Who do you think of when you're thinking about that? We're fortunate at ASIN, of course, to talk to some of the leading investment banks and understand their processes and what they're doing. And many of them are already doing a lot of what I talk about here when it comes to horizon scanning. They are looking at their horizon. They are trying to predict what is the next event that can occur in my organization. They are trying to tackle training and culture But I think some of the places where they fall behind are getting the connectivity across the organization and really connecting it to risk and control. And that's what we do at ASIN. We connect it to the risk and control. So let me give you an example. FINRA, I think it was in August or September, they announced that they had a consultation paper on trace reporting timelines coming down from 15 minutes to one minute. That's huge, right? That's super fast. For asset-backed securities, for structured securities, What does this require? So this really requires, so this is part of the horizon scanning. A, you know that it's a consultation, it's out there. FINRA in that document highlighted that around 80 to 90%, I can't remember the exact figure, of firms already report within a minute. So if you're a smaller player in the market, think about this. If 90% are already doing it, you're probably one of the ones who aren't doing it if you're the smaller player. If 90% of the big players are doing it, it's likely this rule is gonna go into effect. So what are you going to do to prepare yourself and how are you going to do that? When it comes to this, this isn't just about putting that report to the regulator. It's about looking at your whole tech stack. It's looking at the upstream controls that you have in place. What's the booking model that you have in place for these products? How does it flow downstream? How does the report get generated? And what is the tech stack that I need to build to get that out the door within a minute? And that's where horizon scanning needs to go to. So that initial, oh, yeah, okay, I've seen XYZ consultation in the market. That's not just horizon scanning. That's just knowing that it's out there. That's the tip of the iceberg. Digging into it and saying, how does it impact my risk and control environment? That's the exciting piece. That's where we can really start to prevent and start to show where operational risk can get to. 
That's really interesting. And so obviously that excites you. Are there other developments that you're seeing in the industry that also are exciting you? I'm really excited by the fact that banks are really taking on to technology, to fintechs. They always have, but they've tried to do it on their own. So in a lot of cases, they built their own in-house tech teams trying to build fast and agile solutions to the products that their own organization wanted, their own people wanted it, but they were never fast enough to do it because it wasn't their game. It wasn't their business model to do it. And the fact that a lot of these large players, including the consultants that like have got fintech labs and are adopting fintechs, I think that's hugely exciting and promising, of course, for ASIN, but promising more for the wider fintech arena and for the wider op-risk industry as well. The use of AI and technology, I think, for operational risk is going to be huge. Back in the day, a number of my colleagues worked on looking at what are the behaviors that can cause something to happen or can cause someone to do something that's not in line with the way we want risk to be managed within this organization. That is very hard to look at one singular control and say that it is the cause of X, Y, and Z. But using behavioral tools, using AI, putting controls together to say, hold on, a trader logged in late, they've got odd patterns of behavior, they're putting on high risk trades when they shouldn't be, they've never done this and that like before, and they're talking to people they don't normally talk to. We've seen changes in their method of communications and how they are describing what they're doing. That's all behavioral. So I'm really interested actually at how this behavioral risk, which is coming about, is going to be incorporated with op risk and really will elevate op risk. And then lastly, I think the role of a CRO. CROs before focused a lot on market risk, a lot on credit risk. I think op risk is a huge part of their role now. And I'm quite interested just to see where the CRO role will really go and what that will really mold itself into. I think that's a very interesting discussion. And actually, that's come up on several of the podcasts is, you know, what is required now in that role and how broad it's becoming. So that's super interesting. And I love your thoughts around how technology and artificial intelligence are all coming into play and, of course, data. So very interesting. And thanks for sharing your insights and expertise on operational risk. Now, one of my favorite sections of the podcast, rants and revelations. So your revelation, what's something that you've learned recently that really blew you away? I think working in this industry, you see fines coming all the time. It doesn't sound nice to say it like that, but the reality is that fines are quite common. I think what really blew me away recently, and this is probably because I've been working on this space and doing a specific article on this as well, is the two billion in fines and unauthorized communication from two regulators, I should say, from the CFTC and the SEC. And the reason this really blows me away is not because the two billion number is big, but it's because it's the same issue that they find every single bank for at the same time. And I've never seen that before. They've taken that same issue and they find everyone at the same time because all of these banks are doing it wrong. And that just made me wonder, like, I would have really liked to think that someone had got it right, that someone wouldn't have been fined that amount and would have been fined much less. There were degrees in some of the banks to how much they got fined. But on the whole, they all got fined about the same, which really makes you think, how did all of these really smart people get it wrong? How did we all just get it wrong? And it's not the first time that the regulator had said, watch out for unauthorized comms. So it's really surprised me that like everyone has got it wrong and obviously has not been able to provide enough evidence to the regulator to make them back down because they've had to pay up the fine. Interesting. So what's your rant then? What's the thing that you would prioritize to change? Cooking. I hate cooking. <laughs> 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 well, I guess you've got all those delivery options now. You never have to cook. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. But I guess on a more professional note, no, look, you know, this whole ticking the box exercise, it really bothers me. I hate it. There is just no point in wasting resources on ticking a box to prove to the regulator you're doing something. And one of the ones, if I can be specific, that really frustrates me is because I've been through this process in many banks and talked to many people about it is, the whole RCSA process, 
it takes forever to do, it uses so many resources. And what frustrates me the most is, I don't know if anyone can really say what is the value that they actually got from the end of this exercise, other than being able to say we did this exercise, did it actually help you to manage or mitigate your risk better? I don't know if hand on heart, anyone can actually say that given the resources, like there is a better way to do this. And I think one of those ways is that dynamic RCSA look and using data and using technology. But that's one of my rants, right? How do we make this process better? I'm not saying it's not a good process, it's worthwhile doing, but just the way we do it, I just think it's such a waste of really smart people. And can you just expand on that acronym, RTSA? Sorry, RCSA, Risk and Control Self-Assessments. So these are assessments that firms do annually, semi-annually. They take more than a month to put together. In some cases, they may take up to three months. And they're meant to assess the risk and control environment of your organization. But it means you have to pull data from all parts of the organization and then summarize it. And the manner in which it's done and the way in which it's done, it's done as a process and following a procedure versus actually delivering value in in my opinion okay so now we're on to our rapid fire round so it's one word answers to these key questions why governance risk and control or operational risk should be top of the agenda it's the lifeblood of the organization so for me it's the lifeblood yes it manages the organizational health keeps it afloat and it's super imperative for all organizations to get right. Okay, so your one word is lifeblood. Okay, one word for most important focus for the future. Oh gosh, one word, I've got two. Horizon scanning, because I've said it so much, it's horizon scanning, can we make it one? (laughs) (laughs) I'll let you have two. Are you optimistic, pessimistic, or neutral in your outlook for the year ahead? Optimistic, always a glass half full kind of person, cautiously optimistic, but I'm only allowed to use one word, so optimistic. (laughs) Exactly. What word represents success for you? Accomplishment, I think. Accomplishment, being satisfied that you've done something to your best ability, that you are where you want to be and that you're going places. And the top skill needed for a risk professional of the future? Oh my God, top skill, one thing. Mm, Oh, yeah. One thing, I think there's obviously many, but I may to say one, okay, because you asked for one. I think you have to be able to understand an organization and you're like an octopus having your tentacles across an organization. And I've stolen that from Lauren Reader and Morgan Stanley. So kudos to her for telling me that piece there. But in op risk, you really need to understand the whole organization because the people, processes, systems, external events. So you need to have your tentacles and your fingers in many pies. And for that, you need communication and relationship building skills at the utmost best so that you're able to understand, so that you're able to communicate. And then underneath that comes all the other pieces around understanding the data, being thick skinned, being resilient, I'd say, having the agility to move with the times. But if you don't have the relationship building, if you don't have the communication skills, you're not going to know what's going on to be able to do your horizon scanning. So for me, that's super important. Excellent. All right. So we're going to wrap up now with our Risky Women recommendations. So if you can give us your view of what's a book that we should be reading, something worth watching. Sure. I mean, look, I'm not an avid reader, first of all. So I will probably talk a little bit more about documentaries that I've seen, I guess. I love Seaspiracy. Absolutely amazing documentary. It might put you off eating fish, be warned. Definitely an eye-opening documentary. I absolutely loved it. And then I have seen a couple of Netflix or Rakuten, I don't know what it was, but there's one that's new around Elvis and how Elvis's manager, I don't want to give the story away, but watch it. It's about Elvis and how he got to where he got to and what happened in his career. I think that's super, super important and interesting. David Attenborough, I love him, all his documentaries. And then, of course, on a work front, I've got a couple of books that I'm reading, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Patrick Lencioni, The Advantage. I think it's Why Organizational Health Trumps Everything Else or something like that. Those are great, great books. Excellent. All right. That's terrific. And then what's your favorite podcast? Well, I've just recently learned about Risky Women, so that's going to be top of my list and added to my favorite. But look, The Diary of a CEO by Stephen Bartlett, absolutely phenomenal. Everyone who I've listened to on there has a story. 
And I think they are all very honest stories. The one from the Coinbase founder, Brian Armstrong, super interesting about how he got to where he got to, the trials and tribulations he went through, but also what he's like as a character. And then the one from the Monzo co-founder, Tom Blumfield, that was super interesting in terms of just his own mindset and where he was. And what I like about the CEO by Stephen Bartlett is it goes into some of the deep, dark side of people's careers, which we don't often like talking about. And I think that's really encouraging to see people come out of that and how they've come out of that. So I would recommend some of those. Mm, Excellent. Well, we love a good podcast here at Risky Women Radio. So Diary of a CEO sounds very interesting. So that's it. And thank you so much. Loved hearing all of your thoughts around op risk and learning about ASIN and hearing your wonderful push me, pull you career. So thanks for joining us, RuPaul. Well, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to working with you guys a lot more as well. Absolutely. And we look forward to being interconnected with women in risk and control as well. So one big, happy, connected family. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Risky Women Radio. Be part of the ongoing conversation and learn more about our events and other programs at riskywomen.org.